Okay. Streaming live. Carla. Okay.
The program will begin in a few minutes. While waiting, kindly put your microphones on mute. We encourage guests to turn on the cameras later during the Q&A session. And this is a safe space. We expect guests to treat each other with kindness and respect. We'll be beginning in a few. Stay tuned. Welcome to today's Snapshot No Nooks, where we highlight two pieces from the Bantayog na Mga Bayani's archives to shed light on the movement against nuclear power during 1985. We have Dr. Frank Arceliana of the Medical Action Group to share his experiences and insights regarding the forum that happened then. This program is presented by Bantayog na Mga Bayani Library and Museum and the Museum Collective PH. Before we begin, a few reminders. We encourage our Zoom attendees to be on mute to assure the quality of our webinar today. Please turn on your cameras during the second portion of our session, the Q&A session. We encourage everyone to be on speaker view, especially for the ones here in our Zoom room, while the whole short webinar is ongoing. To start off the program, we have the Executive Director of the Bantayog ng Mga Bayani Foundation to give a brief background regarding the highlighted archival materials for today's snapshot. We have Ms. May Rodriguez. Hi, Ms. May. Thank you, you yeah. Hi. Welcome to today's webinar. This is the first of what is to be a series called Today's Snapshot. This is a collaboration between two groups, the Bantayog ng Mga Bayani Foundation and the Museum Collective PH. It is an effort to share with the public parts of the collection in the Bantayog Museum and Archives, especially as we face the restrictions created by the COVID-19 pandemic. Today's snapshot is titled, No New where we highlight certain items in the Bantayog collection that comes from the movement against nuclear power in the 1970s and the 1980s. May I have the BNPP? Yeah. So the Bataan Nuclear Power Plant in Morong Bataan was the center of that controversy in those decades. Now, last July, President Duterte issued an executive order directing the reassessment of the feasibility of operating the plant. The matter was again raised recently at a Senate committee hearing where the energy secretary cited certain nuclear experts from Russia, Russia and South Korea saying it was still possible to open the BNPP. So today we talk about nuclear power and we start with these two documents in the Bantayog collection. The, 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 these are two flyers in our collection. On the left is a flyer calling for attendance to a nuclear forum. And this was sponsored by the Medical Action Group. And it had three doctors as guests, guest speakers, Dr. Francisco Arceliana Jr., Bienvenido Cabral, and C. Uh, Reynaldo Lesaca Jr. I hope that our guest will talk a little about this nuclear forum. On the right flyer, 
uh, is a call for attendance to two events two successive events. The first is a motorcade. It's called Anti-Nuke Motorcade for November 7, 1985, and it was to assemble at the Philippine General Hospital. Again, it was organized by the Medical Action Group. And then the following day and two, two days after uh, the motorcade is a national conference on the Bataan Nuclear Power Plant. It, is to be held, it was to be held at the Asian Institute of Tourism, and this time, it was sponsored by Bayan. So we are um, hoping to start the discussion off from here. But of course, it can go uh, to where the, our guest will bring, bring the discussion to. And so we are very privileged today that one of the most notable leaders of that no nukes group has agreed to leave a busy clinic schedule and join us a while and share insights from that campaign experience. Dr. Frank Y. Arcelliana has been an active surgical consultant at the Capital Medical Center for the past 45 years. For 10 years, he was chair of the hospital surgery department from 2002 to 2012. He was president of the Philippine College of Surgeons in 1999 and chair of the Philippine Board of Surgery in 2000. He belongs to the class 1968 of the College of Medicine of the University of the Philippines and board certified by both the Philippine Board of Surgery and the American Board of Surgery. In the 1980s, convinced about the danger posed by nuclear power on people's health and environment, and as member of the Medical Action Group, Dr. Arcelliana joined a people's campaign against the BNPP. He later became International Counselor of the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, or ITPNW, which was the Nobel Peace Laureate in 1985. Dr. Arcelliana and the late Senator Lorenzo Tanyada were co-chairs of the Task Force Nuclear Free Constitution in 1987. The Task Force Nuclear Free Constitution grew into the No Nukes Group, where Dr. Arcelliana was national chairman, and whose campaign succeeded in ensuring that our Philippine Constitution today, in the Article 2 of Section 8, Article 2, Section 8 of our present Constitution, forbids the presence of nuclear weapons in the Philippines. As IPPNW International Counselor, Dr. Arcelliana was part of the IPPNW International Congresses in Moscow in 1987, in Hiroshima in 1989, and in Stockholm in 1991. Dr. Arcelliana believes that better public awareness about issues related to nuclear power is vital to our national survival. But he can give you his own view. I'm happy to give to you Dr. Frank Y. Arcelliana. Thank you, uh, Mayor Rodriguez, for uh, and the Medical Action Group and uh, Mantayog, na mga bayani and the Museum Collective .ph for this uh, invitation. Uh, I had thought that this issue is is dead because we had already gotten rid of. Uh, the Pasimuno ng Batan nuclear plant during the, the uh, regime of the previous dictatorship. So I thought we had won already. I didn't know that this is being revived, uh, much to our uh, danger and discomfort. So I would like to, uh, would you like me to field questions right away? I see that the time, uh, there's a time limit. We have only half an hour. So, or should I uh, make a short intro regarding this uh, campaign? Just, just to your intro, Doc, we would be so glad to hear from you. Okay, well, actually, uh, the nuclear issue is a very big health issue. And uh, 
nuclear radiation, nuclear pollution, although invisible, is the deadliest in, and it's the ultimate environmental pollution or environmental hazard because a nuclear accident has no bounds. It is has no spatial or temporal limits. You'll have an accident today, but the ill effects can last thousands of years. The effects to the environment, to our food supply, to our health, it causes cancer downstream or downwind. And so it doesn't end today. You can have a plane crash, it ends today. Or you can have a car accident and that's it. But in a nuclear accident, it persists. Up to now, they haven't um, gotten back to the uh, area of the Fukushima health accident. And even at Chernobyl, there's an area that's no man's land. Nobody can go back there to live. And there's a, a high incidence of cancer. So it's the ultimate health hazard and environmental pollution. That's why we doctors at the Medical Action Group uh, made this one of our uh, flagship uh, campaigns, one of our uh, priorities. And it dovetailed with the uh, general campaign, the broad anti-dictatorship front in the early 80s because the construction of this nuclear plant was uh, associated with uh, corrupt corruption to the highest level. Uh, there were plenty of uh, uh, evidences for uh, faulty and shabby construction, cost overruns, escalation of costs from uh, initial $200 million, it became $2 billion by the time we were marching in the streets. So this was a source of corruption traceable to absolute power, which corrupts absolutely. So uh, our struggle against the dictatorship dovetailed against this number one health issue in the Bataan Peninsula. That's why we, this medical action group campaign um, came into fruition. Now, after the EDSA revolution, we were drafting the 1987 constitution. We found it uh, natural and inevitable that we should also campaign against nuclear weapons because uh, we had the US bases here and they would neither confirm nor deny the presence of nuclear weapons, which is actually a policy of uh, imperial bullies <laughs> over their control uh, of their control over us. So that, that's a it's a very uh, that kind of policy is uh, intolerable. So we all know they have nuclear weapons and any nuclear accident and the geopolitical implications of the presence of new nuclear weapons would just bring destruction to the Philippines uh, when, when war erupts in this part of the globe. They'll never have war in their part of the globe. They'll export war here in the West Philippine Sea. So the presence of nuclear weapons, we also campaigned against and should be enshrined in our 1987 constitution. This was article two, section eight and the late Senator Lorenzo Tanyada was my co-chair in this and the no nukes, the no nukes national organization against nuclear weapons was born. And this is a national campaign, not only against the Bataan nuclear power plant, but also the presence of nuclear weapons. And uh, together with this, it became international because we also were members of the International Physicians Against Nuclear War. And we attended their international uh, conventions and congresses to uh, disseminate these issues in the Philippines. Now regarding health hazards, um, I would like to uh, 
tell the audience that uh, when there's a radioactive leak, it's not diluted in the air or in the ocean. The, uh, there is a, a phenomenon called biologic magnification or biologic concentration of nuclear radiation, wherein the, uh, the radioactivity enters the food chain and the biosphere and humans are at the very top of the food chain because we're supposed to be the most superior and uh, we eat everything. So from small fish to big fish to man, radiation travels. It does not get diluted in the ocean. That is the ordinary nuclear uh, radiation emission of a defective plant. Now, it's another matter if when you have an accident, that's a real disaster with uh, the radiation multiplied a million fold. Now, another issue with the botanical power plant and all power plants in the world is the disposal of nuclear waste. Up to now, there is no permanent site or repository of nuclear waste. In the US, the Yucca Mountain is the permanent depository, permanent in quotation marks because they've stopped operating their repository because they found cracks at the bottom of the mountain, the Yucca Mountain, and the radiation can seep down to the aquifer where they get their water supply. And the other issue of uh, nuclear waste is that this uh, toxic products of the nuclear industry can become, they become, to they're toxic for thousands of years, even a million years. Mankind has just existed for 200,000 years. Nobody can build a lasting nuclear repository, nuclear waste repository. Nobody can build a signage that says, keep out danger nuclear radiation for the next thousands of years. People will forget it. It will be uh, forgotten in history and future mankind can get harmed by these repositories. Now, especially so in the Philippines. The Philippines has no geological site stable enough to store nuclear weapons. The Philippines is mostly composed of limestone and coral reefs. It's a very porous country, it's an archipelago. And it is within the ring of fire, a lot of earthquakes and volcanoes. This is the worst place that you can build a nuclear power plant. So because of all these reasons, summarized I try to summarize it as, and compress it as much as I can. Because of these reasons, if you still espouse for this, you're either uh, not informed because this is already a resolved issue. You're not informed or you're a propagandist for the uh, energy industry. That's all I can say right now. Thank you. I can uh, entertain questions. Thank you. Thank you for that sharing, Dr. Frank, um, and for synthesizing in a short amount of time all of the negative effects of, of nuclear energy and nuclear weapons, especially in our context here in the Philippines. We now open the floor to questions. For our Zoom attendees, please utilize the chat box below here to type in your questions. For our Facebook page or Facebook Live attendees, please utilize the comment section. I will now give the floor to Dr. Frank and I will ask Ms. May to come back for the Q&A session. Yeah, feel free to type in your questions. During this lull, I would like to add that the impetus or the renewed interest in the Philippines is our uh, posture to be part of the 
world effort to lower carbon emissions. They think that nuclear energy would contribute to cleaner air, a, <laughs> a, a lower carbon footprint. This is very limited because it is actually a polluting. It's dirty. Yeah. It's invisible, but it's very dirty. If you trace the nuclear power cycle from the mining of uranium to the tailings, the mill ta tailings, there's a lot of radioactivity. During transport, there are spillages. And it's an imported type of fuel. You'll be dependent on this fuel, which is so expensive. And the world stores of uranium will run out in less than 10 years. That's why they're not building any more new power plants, nuclear power plants in the US and Germany and Sweden. They're phasing these out. So uh, I don't know why we are uh, renewing the, the, this project. May I, may I ask the first question, Dr. Frank? Um, Am I right that even the final disposition when that plant is no longer viable is also a huge problem? That entire plant, it, how, do you, how do you close it when you have you to close to decommission it? Decommission it. That yeah. The term of the industry. The commissioning of a plant is done after 30 to 35 years of its existence. And the commissioning is sometimes even more expensive than the construction. You have to isolate the radioactive material, the spent fuel rods within that reactor. You have to decontaminate it. And uh, this is so expensive. And well, where will you bring the spent uh, fuel rods, the radioactive rods, and the gallons and gallons of uh, radioactive water that was used to cool the plant. So it, it's a very expensive endeavor and the poor Philippines cannot, it's not economically sustainable in this country. So am I right that uh, very short term yung concept ng present government in thinking that we can solve our uh, carbon emission by entered by considering another even dirtier and more dangerous uh, source of power there's no visible carbon nuclear. that's why they think it's clean but it's really mm -hmm. diabolically dirty it's invisible but it can kill yeah. and, <laughs> and the effect to the environment and to humankind you know, it lasts for thousands of years potentially and nobody can predict a catastrophic accident. And uh, you have to consider who will run this plant. They can't even run our ordinary thermal plants. They can't even keep the jellyfish out of the Bolinao plant in Pagatina. They can't even uh, have a sustained uh, electricity in our grids. So how, how can they run it? It's the people running it that makes us scared. It's an accident waiting to happen. Mm -hmm. And there's a nearby Mount Native or an earthquake belt. All of the contraindications to reviving or building a plant is there, are there. So, um, and then lastly, it's not economically viable or sustainable. We, you know, during our campaign in the 80s, uh, the expert on the economic viability was the uh, was Senator uh, Bert Romulo and uh, Raf, uh, relative of uh, Senator Recto, forgot his first name. Anyway, this was a very, very well polished and resolved issue already. And uh, we have other alternative sources of energy. The Philippines is built for hydroelectric because we're supposed to have a good forest cover we have a lot of watersheds for our hydroelectric plants. And then we have a lot of sun and wind. So we should go hydroelectric, solar, and wind. We have a lot of ocean currents. We can harness the ocean currents. There's a very strong current be between 
Secret Horror and uh, Negros Oriental. Mm, yeah. And they can utilize this current to uh, provide electricity for the Visayas. Uh, there's already technology to uh, convert uh, alternative motion of waves to rotary motion to run dynamos. And there's so much technology for cleaner energy that's suited for our country that are indigenous, renewable, cleaner, uh, not, not dependent on foreign capital. Cheaper possible. Cheaper, yes. And the accidents, uh, there are no, you know, the accidents won't be as catastrophic uh, as a nuclear accident. There are questions for you, Dr. Arceliana. Sophia? Yes, um, there's someone we got from Facebook. Are there any other uh, readings you recommend for people who want to know more about the effects? That's the first question. The second question, what should schools do related to nuclear power plants and nuclear weapons? Well, uh, you, you, you can Google the, uh, the topic, uh, nuclear power, nuclear waste. There are pros and cons, arguments for and against. Uh, maybe some countries with stable geological sites, they can try to build a nuclear weapon with advanced technology. I'm talking about the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Siting is a very important issue. Mm -hmm. You should not site mm -hmm. your nuclear plant where the, you cannot dispose of the waste. You still have to transport your waste to the Yucca Mountain of the United States. You cannot bury that here. Mm -hmm. You cannot keep it on site because it will leak. It will affect our uh, food sources, our water sources, our marine life. It, it is practically stupid to site mm -hmm. our plant in the Philippines based on uh, current concepts. So uh, this is an issue now because of what happened in the Fukushima mm -hmm. disaster. It's a, it was a triple disaster. It was an earthquake, a tsunami, and a mm -hmm. nuclear meltdown all in one. Mm -hmm. Up to now, they haven't recovered from this. Japan hasn't recovered. They tried to recover with, with hosting the Olympics, but the pandemic got them. Mm -hmm. so, uh, you cannot be too uh, arrogant about this matter. Mm -hmm. yeah. this There's the another number. question. Yes? Um, this is from John Balaguer. He asked, are there currently nations that are run by nuclear means stably, or is it a completely outdated story? France has a lot of nuclear weapons, mm -hmm. uh, nuclear plants, because they, they don't have any indigenous sources of energy. It's just a land mass. They import mm -hmm. oil. So they built nuclear weapons, and they run out of uranium. And you know what? They're recycling the nuclear waste, and this is dangerous. Reprocessing of nuclear waste is a big issue because you can reprocess and convert the waste to plutonium nuclear, uh, as a source of nuclear weapons. This is an issue now in the Iran nuclear deal debate because mm -hmm. the, the pro-Israel uh, is countries think that Iran is a rogue state mm -hmm. and would reprocess the nuclear power waste into nuclear weapons, build nuclear mm. weapons, while the European allies and the U.S., well, U.S. before Trump, thought that the way to pacify Iran is to lift the economic sanctions and monitor their reprocessing, that they concentrate on just nuclear power. Because you can easily convert the nuclear waste which in to, to weapon. nuclear weapons. It's the mm -hmm. nuclear issue is this is these are nuclear power and nuclear weapons are two sides of the same coin they're both nuclear they're both dangerous dangerous, dangerous to mankind uh there there's another question so um this is from victor bautista he said thank you everyone i thank you very much for the enlight for enlightening us on the danger of nuke dr arceliana would you know if historical distortion and denial about nu nuclear power intersect? 
I can imagine how Marcos' apologists, either in social media or in real life, can distort both the history of the dictatorship and even the science around nuclear power. Well, science is science. Mm -hmm. It cannot be distorted. There are arguments for and against nuclear weapons, and we've studied all of them. Uh, I mean, nuclear power, nuclear weapons. But you cannot do that for the Philippines. And they're facing them out in, in a lot of countries, the US, Sweden, West Germany, and um, only those countries who are desperate and uh, uh, with, with uh, lobbyists from the nuclear industry who are contemplating on maybe building a nuclear power plant. And there's new research for nuclear power plant. They, they're pushing this uh, um, nuclear power plant with a pebble bed, pebble bed uh, technology. They say that it will not cause a meltdown. These are all, uh, these, these are all being forwarded in the new technology, which are very expensive. And the, uh, the burning of the nuclear waste using a thorium reactor which is also very radioactive. So, so there's a lot of technology that's pushing the, the, uh, the nuclear power plant, but these are all very expensive and it does not, does not uh, guarantee that there will be no accident. If it's a 100% foolproof, and you can say that mankind or man is perfect, Maybe, maybe, maybe you can, you can adopt this as a, <laughs> not in our country, please, not in our country. Um, we have, we have a space for one more question. Um, I would this... like you as a school, Sana, to, oh, I would, would like to add to that, Doc Frank. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Aurora Parong is here and she asks, what should schools do related to nuclear power plants and nuclear weapons? And I would like to add, uh, since you, you are saying that this is such a, a vital um, parang wisdom that we should have being here in an archipelagic country, hindi ba dapat kasama yan sa curriculum, even ng mga engineering colleges, even ng high school students? Uh, is, the, is it something possible that we can campaign for a no nukes content sa ating mga textbooks? Maybe uh, starting secondary school, high school, or uh, junior high, and those taking up engineering. Yeah. But it is a, a lot of facets, not only uh, purely a source of energy. There are, uh, there are economic aspects, health, environmental, and then uh, statistics regarding the incidence of accidents and a historical review of accidents. Uh, there's so many facets and uh, maybe a postgraduate course on that. So it mm -hmm. becomes a complex issue. Uh, yeah. We have one more question from <laughs> Jeline Avila. Do you see possible political reasons behind Duterte's executive order who stands to immediately benefit from the project? I don't want to go into that, <laughs> but, okay. uh, but uh, the, the uh, attitude of uh, nuclear industry and conventional uh, power, power inter industry, the, the oil industry, the, the ordinary ba basic thermal plant, these are run by companies, corporations with, uh, with the very well-paid uh, lobbyists, propagandists, and uh, they look at the profit, the bottom line, how profitable. They disregard safety and human health. Um, I just read last night, most of the oil companies in the US would not maintain or inspect periodically the long pipelines, oil pipelines, because it's cheaper to clean up an oil spill, even though it will destroy the, the food, the environment, 
it's cheaper than to replace a long segment of pipeline that needs to be replaced. The preemptive, preemptive to an accident, they rather wait for an accident to happen and yeah. the oil to spill because the, the cleanup of the oil is cheaper than replacing that pipeline prophylactic or preemptively. So that's the kind of thinking they have. It's the bottom line, the profit margin. They, they have a cavalier attitude. They don't care about our safety, our environment, our health. Look at the Trump uh, administration now. They reversed all the regulatory uh, the, the loss of uh, the previous uh, administration because they wanted to re revive the coal and oil industry, even though it, you know, it's so detrimental to the environment, mm. people's health. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a big push by corporations, by the energy industry, and they can easily, I'm not saying they're doing this, they can easily lobby, bribe our legislators, or bribe whoever they need to bribe. That's why they like the Marcos regime, because they bribe only one guy. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, competing interests. But we the people should uh, should uh, put to the fore to the forefront the, the health and environmental they can, because you cannot change these things you cannot uh, no amount of uh, lobbying or uh, directives can uh, can change science and can change the effects of this radiation to our health it's there you can read about it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you for answering the questions, Dr. Frank. Um, before we end, we also want to thank um, our, our participants today for joining us um, for, today, for the first leg of today's snapshot. Before we end, please do not forget to answer the survey by scanning the QR code or going to the link flashed on your screens right now to get a certificate. Um, we also invite Victor Bautista right now of the Martial Law Chronicles project to explain to us the competition details for teachers, uh, for teachers. And with that, with that, I give now the, the floor to Victor. Hello, good morning, everyone. So I am Victor Bautista of the Martial Law Chronicles project. Thank you very much for giving me the time to promote our award. So the Gawad Susan Kimpo para sa nandatanging guro. So this is the current program of our group, the Martial Law Chronicles Project. Uh, some of you might know Ma'am Susan Kimpo, who unfortunately passed away earlier this year. And although she was never formally a teacher, as in a teacher as part of a school or a college, she was very influential in shaping the minds of many teachers. After all, in the Martial Law Chronicles Project, one of our key programs is to hold teacher training programs. Okay, And part of the Gawad, Gawad Susan Kimpo para sa natatanging guro is her philosophy in teaching. Because teaching is not only about the mind, it's also diwa, puso, and gawa. Right? So diwa or head, thinking. So in our teacher training programs, when we teach about the dictatorship, it's important to cover things like facts about the economy, about the politics, about the human rights violations. But more than that, it's also important to cover the heart or puso or feeling. And that's why um, one of the most powerful parts of our teacher training programs involves Ma'am Susan's um, own talk during our teacher training programs. When she testifies about the stories of the lost generation, the, the, the martial law martyrs who lost their lives. And it's very emotional and it really gets to the heart of, um, of, the, of what we lost during the dictatorship and what we continue to fight for. And finally, gawa or hand or willing. And it's all about um, not just enriching the mind and not just attending to the heart, but also reaching out and doing things. And that's why Mam Susan Kimpo was very... Um, proactive, you know, meeting so many groups, participating in demonstrations, and reaching out to all sorts of people. So the Gawad Susang Kingpo para sa natatanging guro is open to all levels, from kinder, elementary, 
high school and college. We recently uh, had a chikahan session hosted by our, by our group for different um for different levels, including elementary, high school, and college. So if you want to recommend a teacher or if you want to participate in this award, no matter what level you belong to, you may participate in this competition or award. So the topics that you may include um, if you participate in the award or if you want to nominate somebody for the award, this includes human rights, democracy, martial law history, resistance movements, good governance, civic consciousness, and others. And one way to think about this is that uh, the award is not simply limited to AP teachers, okay? So we open the award to a diverse set of different topics covered in the classroom. So um, the process is from nomination from peers. Um, sorry, I just hit on screen though, so I can't read part of it. So... Yeah, nomination from peers or the community, okay? And th there will be a point system to consider community-based teachers working under marginalized conditions. So um, if the nominees um, work in a non-traditional school setting or work in an urban poor or a rural poor community teaching people, we will very, very much appreciate that when we deliberate in the process. And this is to be awarded in July 2021 roughly one year after the passing of Ma'am Susan Kimpo. So for more details, please see the Facebook pages, uh, We Remember Susan Kimpo, Chikahan sa Faculty Zoom, or the Martial Law Chronicles Project. Thank you, Victor, for sharing this wonderful initiative much. from the Martial Law Chronicles Project. Before we end this session, we also would want to invite again Dr. Frank to share his last words regarding the main topic for our today's snapshot. And yeah, after that. Any last words, Dr. Frank? Okay. Let, before we before we ask him to come back, we also would want to would want to recognize the presence of Mam Judy Tagiwalo today of Bayan. Thank you for joining us. Um, for joining us today. Um, it's a short webinar series, and thank you for being with us in this particular session. Now let's try to for thank the last. You. Thank you. Last. Any last words, Dr. Frank? I thought I was done already. I just <laughs> want to say thank you for inviting me. Uh, I thought, well, I want to repeat that. I thought it was already a resolved issue. I say, hindi na dapat pinag-uusapan to. Pero binubuhay uli. So, well, we don't have any choice but to, to fight it, fight the, uh, the attempts to uh, revive this mothballed nuclear power plant. Um, I don't think they'll succeed because the, uh, the people's movement is, is too strong and too many people are so aware of the, the uh, this abomination, <laughs> this environmental uh, catastrophe waiting to happen. So, uh, I think our leaders are sensible enough to understand this and they should not uh, restart the Bataan nuclear power plant. Now with regards to the West Philippine Sea, again, we should claim sovereignty over this and ban nuclear weapons, ban all those warships, both from China and from the United States and keep the oil beneath the sea. Nobody should be taking the oil out. Uh, it's supposed to be a fossil fuel. We should start our soft energy paths, the wind, the solar, hydroelectric. In hydroelectric, you have a mandatory preservation of the watersheds. They should not cut the trees in the watersheds. That's why we're having all these disasters, these floods. We suffer the full impact of global warming because we have destroyed our forest cover. 
We have destroyed our trees, the watersheds, and you need the watershed mandatory preservation of trees in the watershed to have a viable hydroelectric plant, to have a viable source of energy, which should be hydroelectric for our country. So we're, we're uh, really, uh, in the past 50 years, we've been uh, hoodwinked by the West. And uh, it, it's called energy imperialism. Kung ano dapat nasa atin, yun ating pinalagana, pinadevelop. They were imposed upon us. So maybe it's not too late. We start dredging Pasig River, we start getting all the soil and the silting in our dams, start planting trees, and there should be a total log ban. Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Frank, for sharing. Personal advocacies, personal dreams. Again, uh, <laughs> yes. thank you very much. Thank you again for sharing your thoughts with us this morning. Um, I know medyo iba yung format natin kasi short time, but we want people to have a quick snapshot of these issues. Kasi yun, katulad nga eh, katulad ng sinabi nyo, patuloy siyang binabalik at binabalik kahit tapos na that we thought um, everything is done, it's settled. Pero parang itong horrors ng ating nakaraan ay binabalik sa atin ngayon. Hindi lang yung Batanyo Core Plant, ang dami pang iba. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tama. Oo nga. Okay. <laughs> Marami pa tayong pag-uusap. <laughs> Marami pa. Binabalik. Ang dami na nga nagsakit sa <laughs> buhay. Binabalik pa rin yung mga yun. <laughs> Tama. Binabalik pa rin. So, uh, yeah. So, three things. Um, to Just to summarize. I think number one, um, we heard from the doctor himself, Dr. Frank Arceliana, the negative effect of nuclear power and weapons and energy and the fact that it's not really not really appropriate or hindi talaga siya nababagay sa Pilipinas given our the context where it's built given na archipelagic tayo at given na the whole process pa lang of of cleaning the energy ay hindi pa akma yung technology so yun yung una pangalawa um, ang daming adverse effects na itong nuclear energy and nuclear power na irreversible na kasama na doon yung health hazards na kasama na doon yung health hazards na mararanasan ng mga taong living in the community once once it's there. Like for example what happened in Chernobyl and in Japan. And number three um, yun nga um, our work continues on Kasi pilit na binabalik tong mga to na akala natin settled na. But we still continue on in informing people about these things para ma-integrate din siya sa schools, ma-integrate din siya sa, sa everyday discussions para mas inform din yung decisions natin um, regarding these particular issues. So yeah, again, thank you to everyone who joined us today in Facebook Live and um, here on our Zoom room. Um, this is just the first leg for today's snapshot, the first leg of short webinars with Bantag na ba ng mga Bayani and Museum Collective, where we highlight certain pieces from their archives and their collection, making it as their as the our anchor point for discussion for these issues that are still affecting us today. So yeah, thank you everyone. But before we end, um, we invite everybody to now be on gallery view.